The government is open to delaying the final lifting of England's COVID lockdown on June the 21st, the health secretary says. He confirmed that the COVID variant first identified in India is around 40% more infectious. That does make life more challenging for everybody. And you've seen that the case rates have risen a little. But the good news is that the, the hospitalizations, the number of people arriving at hospital is broadly flat. We'll be asking how worried we should be about how transmissible the new variant is. Also on the programme. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. A permanent memorial to the British fallen at D-Day after 77 years. Cuts to UK foreign aid could harm schooling and health in poorer countries, a warning from hundreds of charities and business leaders. And Max Verstappen crashes out of the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, but Lewis Hamilton fails to take advantage. Good afternoon. The Health Secretary Matt Hancock says the new Delta variant of coronavirus, first recorded in India, is around 40% more infectious than the version de detected in Kent. He said this increased transmissibility is making more difficult the decision on whether to lift all remaining restrictions in England on June the 21st. He stated that the government is open to a delay if needed. But Mr Hancock told the BBC that the number of people needing hospital treatment was broadly flat, which means the vaccines are working. Here's our medical editor, Fergus Walsh. Every jab in every arm is another brick in a wall of immunity against coronavirus. But will that barrier be robust enough to hold back the Delta variant, which is significantly more transmissible than previous strains and has led to a sharp increase in cases? Ministers have just eight days before they must decide whether to lift all remaining restrictions in England. The good news is that the, the hospitalizations, the number of people arriving at hospital is broadly flat and the majority appear to be those who have not had a vaccine at all and only a very small minority of people who've had both jabs. Around three quarters of all cases caused by the Delta variant are in unvaccinated people. Just one in 25 are in those who've had both doses. And although the variant, first identified in India, seems more likely to cause severe illness, those in hospital are generally younger and recovering more quickly than patients admitted over winter. Scientists advising government are uncertain about what the coming weeks may bring in terms of the impact on the NHS. If hospitalisation rates remain flat, then I think there will be a substantial further easing of restrictions, possibly retaining uh, the need to wear face coverings in um, public transport, maybe still encouraging people to work from home if possible. And there were mixed views in London today about whether all remaining restrictions should be lifted on the 21st of June. It's more because I'm vaccinated right now that I would say yes, but depending on the, on the people, if you're not vaccinated, I can understand that you're maybe not that comfortable. I would feel okay sat next to someone on the train as long as they were wearing a mask, but I think the two go, social distancing and masks going at the same time would probably be a bit much. It wouldn't bother me if we, we waited a couple of weeks into July because of the, the Indian variant. I think that, that, that element of caution might be worthwhile in the long run for us. Bolton, which was the area worst hit by the new variant, is now seeing a decline in cases and, more importantly, a fall in the number of COVID hospital patients, which thankfully remained far lower than in previous peaks. In England, booking will open this week for the under-30s to get their first dose of vaccine. Public support for COVID immunisation remains very high in the UK. And with 27 million people now fully immunised, many of those will be wondering when legal restrictions on their freedoms to meet and travel will finally be lifted. Fergus is here with me now. Fergus, how worried should we be about this news that this variant is 40% more transmissible? Well, that assessment a few weeks ago from 
the SAGE committee of scientists said that if it was 40% more transmissible, then we could have a wave of summer hospitalizations worse than in January. Now, that was a very gloomy assessment, um, and we're not going to see that. Um, the big question is, is it going to be a, a wave this summer or just a ripple? Now, what we didn't know three weeks ago is the good news that the vaccine really works. It really does give strong protection against the Delta variant. Two doses, not 100%, but very high protection. Um, and ministers and scientists are going to need every scrap of data in the coming week before they make a decision on further unlocking. And it is finally balance that decision there. So although it is uh, more transmissible um, and it seems to give a more li stronger likelihood of severe illness, um, it does seem that the vaccine is building this wall of immunity. Now as to the autumn, we may get an autumn immunization campaign for children, but frankly scientists who are advising on that are divided about whether that will be needed. Fergus, thank you. Fergus Walsh there. The latest government figures on coronavirus show that four people are reported to have died and there have been 5,341 new infections in the latest 24-hour period, which means an, an average of 4,785 new cases per day in the last week. 203,613 people have received a first dose of the vaccine in the latest 24-hour period. And over 40.3 million people have now had their first jab. That's 76.6% of UK adults. While the number of people who've had their second dose of the vaccine in the latest 24-hour period is 473,378, which takes the overall number who've had their second jab to over 27.6 million, meaning 52.5% of UK adults are now fully vaccinated. The British Normandy Memorial for those who died in the D-Day campaign during World War II has been officially opened on the 77th anniversary of the Allied invasion of Nazi-occupied France. The names of nearly 22,500 servicemen and women are inscribed on 160 columns overlooking Gold Beach, one of the three British landing sites in France. Hugh Schofield reports now from Vers-sur-Mer. At last, the veterans have what they've been pushing for for years a single focal point where future generations can come to learn of D-Day and the Normandy campaign and to honour the names of the thousands who sacrificed their lives. The ceremony was simple and attended by only a small number of people. Because of Covid there were virtually no veterans in France. Instead, in rather less clement weather, many of them gathered at the National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire and watched proceedings via live transmission including this message from Prince Charles. I can only hope that this serves to commemorate all those whose lives were lost during the events of June 1944 and between D-Day and the liberation of Paris at the end of August 1944. There was a two minute silence to honour the 22,442 names that are engraved on the columns of the memorial. And then, accompanied by the French Defence Minister, the UK's ambassador in Paris, Lord Llewellyn, laid a wreath and cut the ribbon to declare the memorial officially open. The memorial was only completed a few weeks ago. The press has been very deliberately kept away. And because of Covid, there are very few visitors in Normandy at the moment who could spread the word. As a result, the scale and the beauty of this place have come to many as a monumental surprise. It's set on a hill looking down on Gold Beach, where thousands came ashore on D-Day. Built in pale burgundy limestone, there's a central temple-like structure with a statue of three infantrymen caught in the grip of an attack. And then the cloister of pillars, arrayed with the names of the dead and the dates they died as the Normandy campaign progressed. For the veterans watching in England today, a fit place to remember their friends and comrades. It should have been done years and years ago while a lot of us were still alive. I mean, I'm in my hundredth year now. I mean, I'm lucky to keep going. I think it's wonderful. It's marvellous that they can put this ashore on like this 77 years after. In France, the Red Arrows display team flew past in homage to the dead. Then the hubbub over and the flags raised 
the memorial became what it's destined to remain, a place of contemplation and quiet memory. Hugh Schofield, BBC News in Normandy. More than 1,700 charities, business leaders and academics have signed a letter warning that government cuts to foreign aid of almost £4 billion a year will hit the world's poorest communities and mean that families go hungry. Conservative MPs are threatening a rebellion in the Commons tomorrow. Ministers say the pandemic means spending has to be temporarily cut and it will still spend more than £10 billion this year on aid. Here's our political correspondent, Chris Mason. Scrubbing floors, struggling to reach the shelves. Saida is nine years old and works as a servant to earn money for her family in Bangladesh. These pictures were given to us by a charity which secured permission to do this filming. Saida would love to go to school. The UK Bangladesh Education Trust applied for government funding to expand its programme to help girls working as domestic servants learn to read, write and count. But it was told the fund from which it hoped to get a grant had closed because of cuts to the foreign aid budget. Over 1,700 charities, business leaders and academics have now signed a letter pleading with the government to change its mind. In it, they write that without an about turn, the UK's credibility and voice on the international stage will be undermined. We don't snatch the one textbook it's ever had in its life from its only tin shack school. More than 30 Conservative MPs, including the former Prime Minister Theresa May, hope to secure and win a vote in the Commons tomorrow to compel the government to change tack. To go back on our commitments, these are legal commitments as well as manifesto commitments, uh, in the middle of a, in, of a pandemic uh, where none of us will be safe from Covid until all of us are safe and where Britain's about to lead the G7 uh, conference this week in Cornwall, it's a terrible error of judgement. But ministers insist... Well, I think it is reasonable at a time of this enormous economic challenge as well as, of course, the health challenge uh, to take this action. And, you know, if you think really? about it... Yeah, well, we've had, a, what you've heard? we've had a once in 300 years economic interruption. The government's supporters argue that you would never recommend a neighbour went into debt to donate to charity... And the same logic holds true for the country. Chris Mason, BBC News. In the last hour, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have announced the birth of their second child, a daughter, on Friday. The couple, who haven't released any photos of the new baby, have named her Lilibet or Lily Diana Mountbatten Windsor, after her grandmother and her great grandmother. The couple, who said that they felt blessed by the arrival, also have a two year old son. Time for the sport now. Here is Chetan Patak at the BBC Sports Centre. Chetan. Rita, thank you. Good afternoon. A Lewis Hamilton mistake and a Max Verstappen crash meant Sergio Perez won this afternoon's Azerbaijan Grand Prix. It was all fairly uneventful in Baku until a dramatic end. Ben Croucher reports. Some say F1 has become too predictable these days. It's either Lewis Hamilton or Max Verstappen winning. So far this season, yes. Today, not a bit of it. It's lights out. The first sign of drama came for Lance Stroll, a tyre failure at 200 miles an hour. A freak accident, right? He walked away unhurt. Despite the crash, Verstappen still led. Hamilton stayed stuck behind the two Red Bulls. No way past. I definitely can't uh, attack and overtake these guys. So he needed some luck. Verstappen, the leader, out. Another tyre blowing the race and the championship back in Hamilton's favour. Could he kick Verstappen whilst he was down? The restart was his chance, the win in his grasp, the overtake on Sergio Perez, overshot. Oh, so sorry, guys. Putting the brakes only on his title ambitions. It left the door open for Verstappen to keep the championship lead and Perez to take a victory as memorable as it was unpredictable. Ben Croucher, BBC News. England are attempting to bat out the final two sessions and draw the first test against New Zealand at Lords, chasing 273 to win. They're currently 124 for two. Patrick Geary's been watching. Final day at Lords. Pick a direction, set your pace. 
To win the match, New Zealand needed to travel fast, score quickly, take the game as far from Englishmen's grasps as possible. That came with risks England might catch them. But the Kiwis like a challenge, so at lunch they got the game rolling, declaring and setting England 273 runs to win. New Zealand would need 10 wickets. They were thinking perhaps of an English batting collapse, but Rory Burns drew some of their sting. After one bruise, 25 runs and nearly two hours, he eventually departed. Zach Crawley was far less stubborn. 56 for two. By now, in the final session of the match, England were thinking of saving it, not winning it. Safety first can still be scary. After all, one touch might topple the tower, but despite spending all day in a bustling hurry, it seems New Zealand will ultimately run out of time. Patrick Geary, BBC News. And that is all your sport for now. Back to you, Rita. Thanks very much, Chet. And that's it from us. We're back with the late news at 10. Now on BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Bye-bye.